What I'm going to be talking about today is category development in children with autism. And before I start, I want to take some time just to um, acknowledge where this data came from. Um, so uh, Dr. Leticia Nagels from the University of Connecticut was kind enough to share the data that she had collected with me for this analysis. So this is work that came from um, Dr. Nagels and Dr. Fine, and it was collected by the Child Language Lab at the University of Connecticut, and it was collected by Caitlin Reynolds, Christian Navarro Torres, and Janima Petrosky. And this was funded by um, a grant that was awarded to Letty Nagels from the National Institute of <coughs> Deafness and Communication Disorders. So to give you guys just a little bit of background, I'm sure everybody knows this, but it's good to review, autism is a neurodevelopmental disability and it's characterized by impairments in communication and social interactions in the presence of restricted and repetitive stereotype patterns of behaviors, interests, and activities. The current estimated lifetime per capita cost of an individual with autism is $3.2 million, and the most recent prevalence numbers put it at it's estimated that approximately one in 50 individuals have been diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. So given how prevalent this disorder is and the fact that communication is a defining feature of this disorder, it's really important for us to have a really good understanding of language development in this population. Um, what makes this even more important is the fact that expressive language by the age of five is one of the best predictors of outcomes for individuals with autism. So given that, it really behooves us to figure out where they're looking the same as typical language learners and then where we see them diverging in their language development from the typical language learners. And category development offers a really important place to look. And the reason for this is that category development is a cornerstone in cognitive development and language development. And so if we can have a better understanding of what category development looks like in this population, we can really get at something that's <coughs> fundamental for language learning. There's been um, some research that has examined the categorization skills of individuals with autism. And what's really noticeable about this research is the fact that there's a wide amount of variability in what they're finding. So some studies report intact abilities. Other studies report mixed findings within the groups in that research study. And then other studies find that there are poor abilities. And what's really noticeable is not only do we see these mixed results across research studies, Part of this may be explained by the fact that we have different tasks that are being used, there's different age groups, there's a variety of confounding factors as to why we may be getting these different results, but it's also really noticeable or notable that there are mixed findings even within studies. And so some work that Letty Nagels did in her lab looked at categorization skills during a, categor excuse me, a categorical induction task um, with adolescents with high functioning autism and they compared them to a group that had been matched on the basis of language and IQ. And so we would expect them to be performing the same if their category structures are the same as their peers because they've been matched. Um, and so what they did in the categorical induction task is they presented kids with a diverse set of stimuli in the single set of stimuli or a diverse set and a homogeneous set. And so the diverse set, and they did use snakes, and I'll just tell you guys when I was getting these pictures, I got shivers because <laughs> I hate snakes. Um, so, so with the diverse set, what you can see is they're really variable, right? So the snakes all look somewhat variable. And in the more homogeneous set, there's a unifying factor across this group of snakes. And so for one set, they would introduce the um, diverse set and say this set, um, this group of snakes has blue eyes, and then this group of snakes has gray eyes. They would then introduce a novel snake that the individuals hadn't seen, and then say, what color eyes does that snake have? 
And we would expect that kids would use that um, diverse cue, right, because it extends to more exemplars. And what they found was that both the um, school-age adolescents with high-functioning autism and the typical language learners both extended the diverse properties, just like we would expect, at a level above chance. But when they really looked into the data, yeah, the kids with autism were extending at levels above chance, but they weren't being really consistent in this extension across the experiment. So sometimes they would apply it, sometimes they wouldn't apply it, even though it was at a level above chance, which is really surprising. They seem to have figured out that this was a really relevant property, but they're not being systematic in using this across a research study. And so when we think about this variable performance, we're seeing it really within this population in general. So the question becomes not only how can we explain why these kids look different than our typical language learners, but also why do we see this incredible variable performance within this population. And Dynamic Systems offers a really nice theoretical framework for thinking about this. Within Dynamic Systems, you've got different pieces of information that are coming together and they're being softly assembled within a task to yield a specific performance within that task. And this will make more sense when I go through some examples. But what you're bringing is you have the knowledge that you're bringing to a task, and then you also have the properties of the task itself. And one of the ways that this has been illustrated, and I think it really gets at this idea of variable performance and how these two pieces can come together, is when we look at how little kids, toddlers, are extending labels for objects. And so the knowledge that kids bring to the task, little toddlers, they know that if you see, if you're presented with a rigid, solid object, so if you see something or presented with something that's ball-shaped, they know that you extend that label on the basis of shape, right? And this is a very consistent cue for label extension. However, if you present little kids with something that's a non-solid object, like shaving cream, they know that they should be extending it based on material. And so what we see is they've got two really important pieces of knowledge that they're bringing to the task. This is something that we see kids doing consistently, and so it's something that we've identified as a stable behavior. And so within dynamic systems, a stable behavior is something that you perform, you get that same behavior or task outcome regardless of how you vary the task. However, as you can imagine, when you think about objects in general, we have rigid, solid objects. We have non-solid objects, but this really falls on a continuum. So not all objects are solid, solid objects, and not all objects are non-solid objects. And so researchers have called these objects that, call, that fall in between, they've labeled them as deformable objects. And so with these deformable objects, there's not a consistent cue for that class of objects, for what they should be using to generalize the label. And so if you think about paper, for paper, texture or material becomes a really relevant cue for generalization. And that is how we generalize that label. But if you think about socks, which are also, also a deformable object, that material is no longer a relevant cue, and in that case, shape becomes a really relevant cue. So with these objects in between, we see that there isn't a set of consistent cues that kids can use for determining how they're gonna extend that name of that object. And so what some researchers have done is they looked at whether or not you got variable performance in children based on the knowledge that they're bringing to the task and then the property of the task itself. And so what Kalunga and Smith found was that when they presented toddlers with objects that really varied in the degree of solidity, the more solid the object was, 
the more likely the child was to extend that label on the basis of shape. The less solid the object was, the more likely they were to use a material extension. So we see this shift just based on degree of solidity with how they're extending names. And another um, research study that came out of Larissa Samuelson's lab at Iowa, they found um, an even a more robust interaction, I want to say, to highlight the point I'm trying to make. So what they did was when they, they presented two different tasks. So they had solid objects, deformable objects, and non-solid objects. And they presented the task, and sometimes the children, some of the children, um, when they were asked about the label extension, they were asked in a forced choice question format, and the other group of kids, they were asked in a yes-no format. So all that's changing is how you're asking the test question. And what they found is the kids consistently extended on the basis of shape for the solid objects. They consistently extended on the basis of material for the non-solid objects. But then for the deformable objects, when the children were asked a forced choice question, then they used shape-based extensions. But when they were asked yes-no questions, it was really variable what they were using. And so this is showing how what kids know and they're bringing to the task, plus how you actually set up the task, if there's not a consistent set of cues that children are paying attention to, you can get really variable performance in what you're seeing the children do. Is this all typical kids? Yeah, this is all typical kids, yeah. Um, and uh, typical little toddlers. And so um, why I think dynamic system then really can help us think about what we're seeing with autism is we see this incredible, incredibly varied performance in tasks where we see stable performance in typical language learners. And so why do we see this variability across research studies? And then why also do we see this variability within what kids are doing within a research study itself? And I think that becomes a really important thing to think about when we're thinking about language development in this population. So um, this is also, um, this is work that was done um, out of Holly Gaskeb's lab, and they were looking at the influence of stimulus typicality on the categorization abilities. And so just like there was that continuum of solid and non-solid objects, we also have a continuum in all of our categories, right? So for each category that we have, we have very typical or good representations of a category, and then we have more atypical category members that may not be such a good representation of that category. And so if you think about the category of birds, ostriches look very different and are very atypical members, whereas robins are really typical members. And she wanted to see, we know um, that typical language learners are more accurate when they see typical than atypical category members. So to get out whether or not kids with, or, um, kids with autism are organizing their categories in the same way, she used a category verification task to investigate the category skills of school age, adolescents, and adults with high functioning autism. And it was really nice because she matched them all to peers based on language. And so we can then see are there differences in how the categories are being structured when we've equated the two groups for language. So in the task, what they did was they heard the name of a category such as dog, and then they would see a picture up on the computer screen. So if they, if they hear dog, they may see something like a couch, and then they press a button if it was correct, so this is a dog, yes or no. And um, what she did was she varied the categories by typicality. So within each category, there were atypical category members, somewhat typical category members, and typical category members to determine how accuracy and reaction times varied. And what they found was with the school-age children, both groups were slower and less accurate on atypical than typical stimuli. So they look like the typical language learners. But in general, the kids with autism were just slower than their typically developing peers. And in this study, the typicality of the stimuli had a greater effect on the reaction times for the autism group 
than the typically developing group. So if it was atypical, they were slowed even more than the um, typical language learners in addition to just being slower overall. And when they looked at the results from the adolescents and adults, we see this same pattern emerging. So when we get up to school age, kids with high functioning autism, they look really similar to peers who they've been matched with. So what we wanted to do in this study was to take this task and extend it down to a younger group of children. So for the purpose of this study, we were investigating the categorization abilities of preschoolers with autism. And within this, we want to see, do um, preschoolers with autism demonstrate the same stimulus typicality effects as typically developing language learners? So do we see that same effect where they're responding faster and more accurately to typical than atypical stimuli? And then we also wanted to see whether or not there were differences in the performance stability between the children with autism and the typical language learners. And so I will get more into this, but this is really coming from that dynamic systems framework to not, to not only get at how do they look overall, but what's happening within that real-time performance for these children. Um, these participants were part of a larger longitudinal study that was examining language development in children with autism. So when they entered the study at visit one, the children with autism were about three and a half year old, years old, and then we had their young, they had been matched to this group of typical language learners on the basis of language. So you can see a couple years later, we still have that significant difference in age, which we would expect um, because kids with autism have delayed language development. But we also see that they've diverged in their development over the course of time. So the test of auditory comprehension of language was used as a measure of language skills. And we see over time that the children who are typical language learners have significantly better language scores than the children with autism. We also see that when we look at their IQ scores as measured by the differential ability scale, that once again, over time, the children who are typical language learners are scoring significantly better than the children with autism. And so although these groups are different, right, so they've come, they've accessed language and acquired language differently over the course of a couple of years, we can still see whether or not their patterns look the same. And so what we had done is we had used that same ta um, task that had been used in Holly Gatzgeb's lab, and this was a category verification task. And the children saw four different categories, cars, birds, chairs, and cats. And one of the notable things about the categories that they use in this study is all of them emerge really early in typical language development. So by the age of 30 months, 90% of children have acquired these words and these categories. So now we've got children who are about six years old. So we would expect even if they're slower language learners, they've still had a lot of experience um, with these categories. So within each category, children saw typical, somewhat typical, and atypical category exemplars. Um, there was a very rigorous process that went into um, determining the typicality. I'm not gonna get into that now, but if you have questions about that, um, I can refer you to Letty Nagels. <laughs> um, so the way the task was set up is it was programmed in E-Prime and the children watched the um, stimuli come up on the computer screen. And they heard, this is a, whatever the name was, a picture came up and then they hit a red switch if it was incorrect and a green switch if it was correct. Um, and I know one speech, two speech language pathologists are in the crowd, so these were Big Mac buttons, so they were really big buttons to hit and really nice switches to activate. There were 72 trials in total, and what this had done is they presented this over the course of two sessions. And so children saw within each category, 24 category members of varying typicality, and then there were also 48 FOILs that were presented. So what I'm gonna go through with the analysis is first we'll talk about the stimulus typicality, 
With that, we're looking at how their accuracy and reaction times, did they differ based on whether it was the stimuli was typical, somewhat typical, or atypical. And then to look at performance stability, what we did was we looked at the trial that had come right before. And so one of the things in dynamic systems is within a task, you have the knowledge that a children's child's bringing to the task, and then you have what's happening in the task itself. And one of the things that can influence performance is what children are seeing that trial right before. So what we want to see is whether if a child saw an, a somewhat typical stimuli, so you can think of that as following, falling in the middle of that continuum, if they see an atypical exemplar right before it, do they respond differently? Is their accuracy or reaction time affected um, in contrast to when they see typi uh, excuse me, typical stimuli right before it? So we, we're looking at these somewhat typical trials and we're seeing whether or not we see differences in performance based on whether an atypical exemplar came before or a typical exemplar came before. Um, our preliminary analysis indicated that our data was not normally distributed and was pretty much violating everything. So um, all of the stats that I did are non-parametric stats. Um, and then what I want to do is talk about um, the patterns across each group independently, first for the stimulus typicality. So when we look at our typically developing group, you can see um, accuracy is on the y-axis, and then um, the uh, different stimuli is on the x-axis. For the typically developing group, when we look to see whether or not we could collapse across visit one and visit two, there is a significant difference in their accuracy for the atypical stimuli between visit one and visit two, so we didn't collapse those. And what we, so here we've got atypical at visit one, atypical at visit two, somewhat typical, and then typical. And what we see is that they're typical, when they see typical stimuli, they are more accurate than the somewhat typical stimuli. And they're also more accurate when they're presented with typical stimuli than atypical stimuli at visit one or visit two. Um, and I just want to say, point out, these are standard error bars, so they are a bit larger, than, um, which is why they do overlap a little bit, even though we did find these significant differences. With, return, with regards to the somewhat typical stimuli, we see that, in addition, the typically developing kids were more accurate when they were presented with the somewhat typical typical stimuli, then the atypical stimuli at visit one, and the atypical stimuli at visit two. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing this same pattern of results, right? So they're more accurate with responding to typical than atypical stimuli, and we see that's across the continuum. The kids with autism are here in the yellow, and you can see atypical has been collapsed into one um, visit because there was not a difference between the two. And when we looked at the results, we saw that for the typical and somewhat typical stimuli, there was not a significant difference in their accuracy. However, the kids were much more accurate when they, respond, when they saw typical stimuli as compared to atypical stimuli, and um, significantly more accurate when they were presented with somewhat typical stimuli than atypical stimuli. When we look at the reaction time, what we see is a very similar pattern. So our typical language learners are faster when they're responding to typical than somewhat typical stimuli, than when they're responding, when we compare typical and atypical stimuli, and then they're faster in responding to somewhat typical than atypical stimuli. In terms of the latency patterns for the autism group, there was not a significant difference at all. So it didn't matter what type of stimuli they saw, we see that their reaction times did not differ. So, with, so we've now got this idea of kind of what the pattern of performance looked like over the course of the experiments with regard to the typicality. And so one of the other things that I'm really interested in is, is the not, you know, what does it look like in real time performance and are they being influenced by what's happening right before? And so, once again, when we look at the typically developing group, we have the somewhat typical stimuli that was preceded by a typical exemplar, 
and then when somewhat typical stimuli was preceded by atypical, um, an atypical exemplar. And you see performance looks really comparable, and there's not a significant difference between the two. When we look at the kids with autism, we see a really different picture. Um, so when the kids with autism saw somewhat typical stimuli preceded by typical stimuli, they're doing okay. If there's an atypical exemplar that's preceding the somewhat typical stimuli, we see this big drop in their performance. And it's a, stati a statistically significant difference in their accuracy. And it's notice notable because this is somewhat typical stimuli. There's no difference there. The only difference is what's happening right before they see that, that exemplar. When we looked at latency, there's no difference in either group based on what they saw right before. And so just to summarize these results, what we see for our typically developing group is that in terms of just overall task performance, they're responding much more accurately and faster to typical than atypical stimuli. And we see a pretty um, similar pattern of results in terms of accuracy, where they're more accurate when they see typical than atypical stimuli, but we don't see any difference in reaction times here. In terms of performance stability, there wasn't a change at all in our typically developing group, right? It didn't matter what was coming right before in terms of accuracy or in terms of latency. This is different than what we're seeing in the autism group. So in the autism group, what we're seeing is when there's an atypical exemplar that's coming before a somewhat typical exemplar, we see this drop in performance, although we don't see a change in their reaction time. So the question, so to kind of put this back into the framework of what we had talked about before, with regards to the previous research using this task, what they had found was that children were faster and more, were more accurate when presented with atypical than atypical stimuli. And we can see with our little kids here that they pretty much follow that same pattern in terms of accuracy. Where we're differing from what they had found with these older kids is the younger kids with autism, latency just doesn't seem to be affected by typicality. Um, and so the question then becomes, you know, is this something that we see developing over time where kids don't yet have those robust connections where we're seeing that faster response? And this is something that I think bears more um, exploration of why do we see this difference in latency over the course of development. With regards to the performance stability, um, these results were really interesting, I think, because they highlight, yeah, we see this same pattern, but when you really kind of dig in and look at what's happening over real time, the kids look really different. And there we see this variability in the children with autism that we're not seeing in our typical language learners. And if you think about kids with autism, this lack of generalization, this difficulty is something that's pretty um, consistent with the disorder in general. With regards to typical language learner, it's been hypothesized that children learn language by tracking the statistical regularities that are present in their environment. And so this idea of children or toddlers in that task I had talked about before, they come in knowing that if I am presented with a solid rigid object, I should pay attention to shape and extend on the basis of shape. Um, work by Larissa Samuelson and Linda Smith has shown that this really seems to be something that's developed out of children's statistics. And so if you look at children's early vocabularies, what we see is that the majority of their early words are solid count nouns, right? And so when they hit 50 words in their expressive vocabulary, we see the emergence of this shape bias. So there seems so we see that the statistics in their early vocabularies support attention to shape, and then there seems to be some sort of threshold in terms of when they've accrued enough information to know, yeah, I should be paying attention to this. 
Um, and this is important because we know that this ability to extend on the basis of shape really facilitates language development. And we see that um, this nice robust gain in language development when children begin to demonstrate a shape bias. When we think about children with autism, the regularities in their long-term experiences are definitely different than the children with typical, um, with typical development. And it may also be that the regularities that they're extracting are different than the typical language learners. And so um, some research um, by Siami Tech found that children with autism fail to develop a shape bias even after they've acquired 50 words in their vocabulary, right? So if the shape bias is set on the statistics that the kids are getting, and they once again, are, they, they've got the same amount of words in their vocabulary, we would expect them to learn that shape is a relevant cue, but there's some sort of dissociation between the words that they're getting and the regularities that they're extracting. Um, and we also see that children with autism in another research study, it found that the children with autism were really variable in their ability to extract the regular relationships that they were presented with. And so while typical language learners, there are a variety of things, cues that they could attend to, and the typical language learners were able to track all of those regularities, the children with autism in that study weren't. So it seems like there's something inherently different about how the kids with autism are learning language. So even when they do have language that's the same size and you know, their vocabulary looks the same size, there's something very different in terms of that vocabulary. If you think about the fact that they got pushed around when they saw that atypical stimuli right before a somewhat typical stimuli, this would suggest that they don't have a firm idea of what cues they're supposed to be attending to. And if you see something atypical right before, this might shift your attention, leading to poor performance. And so what, this, what I think is exciting about this is that um, this, these findings support other research that suggests that kids with autism are developing their lexicons differently than our typical language learners. And it also really suggests that dynamic systems is gonna be a really useful theoretical framework for thinking about learning in these kids. And so not only do we see these differences in how they're organizing their lexicons, but how do these differences really influence real-time performance in really subtle ways that can actually have very real repercussions. Um, so I apologize, I do not have a citation slide up here, and I'm happy to email my citations to anybody who would like them. Um, but that's, that's it. <laughs> You know, um, we stuck with the somewhat typical because we would expect that's where we would see the variable performance just because um, th with the typical, we would expect that to be really entrenched, right? So this is what this category member should look like. And with atypical, they may have learned that a little bit more because um, it's novel. And that somewhat typical is where we hypothesize we would see that shifting. Um, so we haven't looked at those other areas. Um, and that could be interesting too. And part of um, these results are interesting, but the experiment wasn't actually set up to look at that. And so it'd be really interesting to do something where we are set up to see how does performance shift where we're really concentrating on that. My, what I'm wondering is, you know, you talked about the shape bias and mm -hmm. not paying attention to the right cues, and, and that makes sense from a theory, theoretical standpoint. But I also wonder, too, like how much of it is almost like a response latency. You know, are they just a little bit slower in processing what's going on, and if that's happening, then I would expect to see a similar influence in regardless of the combination. Yeah, that's that's definitely could be a very plausible explanation and something worth looking into. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs>
No, and that is something that we should absolutely do um, because that could be really interesting too. I know um, some study with typical language learners, typical infants has found that um, they were looking at looking patterns and the looking patterns of the strong and the weak learners were same in the beginning and then where you saw them really diverging was in the middle and so that could be something that's happening too where they look more similar in the beginning and then over time we see this divergence. Yeah. Sometimes you guys all start to get too tired and crap mm -hmm. out, and so it would be interesting to see you know, where this falls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially with the resilient time response rate. So we wonder if that would really be impacted by that after the fact, or just by being tired. Yeah, yeah. And my guess is um, because with autism, that latter half of the experiment could prove to be incredibly problematic for them. Mm -hmm. Um, just because their attention um, is not as good as our typical learners. Um, so that, that would be really interesting too. I have a question. Yep. And this might just be your opinion, but the, talking about this you know, category examination, what do you think that does then for these children's vocabulary? Because obviously if they can't categorize this new information or new So what I, th <laughs> um, I will get on my soapbox a little bit right now, so I'll apologize. Um, all of the kids in the study are getting ABA. Um, so are people here familiar with ABA for the most part? So if you think about um, what's happening in ABA, that's a very different language learning experience than what's happening um, just in typical language development. If we think about what's happening in terms of statistics, um, I'm not sure, you know, if we're doing this rote learning, what we're actually getting the kids to pay attention to. And I think that might be part of the problem. So I think what's happening is um, that you're learning these individual pieces and you're not really pulling out what's relevant. So you have to kind of keep learning, you have to continue to learn piecemeal and you're not making these broader connections that really once we see these broader connections, we see this incredibly rapid growth in what kids are doing. And so I'll go, I, I'm a big fan of the shape bias, so I'll do another example from there. Um, in Larissa Samuelson's lab, they had taught a group of kids who did and did not have the shape bias. The kids were just coming into lab and they were just having um, some experiences with solid, you know, they weren't, ex it was through play where it just, they were really having the kids pay attention to shape. And so over the course of the training, there was a control group that just came in to the lab and then this group that was playing with solid objects and just, they were kind of saying, oh, this is a DAX, this is a DAX, this isn't a DAX to draw attention to the shape. And so we saw this big, you know, we see a growth in their language over time. The group of the kids that actually got that um, solid object experience and they developed a shape bias. And then not only that, but their, the control group, their vocabularies grew by I think like 50 or 60% and there was 125% growth in the group that actually got the shape bias. And so if, if we're just teaching these, you know, this is a car, this is a car, this is a car, and we're not saying, you know, these are the relevant pieces of information, then in terms of learning, you're not gonna be able to come, become an independent learner in some ways where you can look at that and go, I know how to extend this. I'm pulling out those regularities that matter for learning. And so I think it becomes a really big issue and it just doesn't enable them to be learning independently in a way that we would want them to. So they're not learning the things that will facilitate more learning. Um, and that's not to knock ABA in any way, shape or form. Um, but I think we just haven't thought about what are we teaching these kids to pay attention to and what are we teaching them that's relevant. I kind of went all over the place. Did I answer your question? <laughs> Mm -hmm. my master's and I can't tell you how many times I've handed a child a stack of cards and said, put these in the right categories and they're just supposed to, you know, put them in the right categories, but we've never went to really discuss why or what shapes they were or yeah. what made that in a, a member of that category or not. Yeah, and it's, it's really interesting to, uh, to begin thinking about kind of talking, you know, having more, you know, what are we really teaching them? Um, and I think that this is, we also don't do this as speech therapy, right? I mean, this is, this is just another way of thinking about language learning in general. Um, and I think it can real yield, 
you know, and it's great because then the kids have those categories, but how stable are those categories? Are we going to see that generalization that we want to see? And here, if, if you are, you know, able to be shifted around that much, your performance is going to be really variable over time, which can be problematic. Um, I can double check with this. I think just a couple days. Oh. Um, it was. Why did they decide to bring the table? With the typical, I do not know. That was. <laughs> tell you, I was looking at it day. I was like, what is going on? Um, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. Um, it was different stimuli, so they only saw half of the stimuli at visit one and half at visit two. So I'm not sure what engendered that that difference that we saw. I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting, and I, I have no explanation for it <laughs> at all. Because they, they weren't getting reinforcement at all during the task. Right. Um, so I'm not sure why their performance changed. Oh, and, and this, um, do you know, I, I don't know, right? Because would these kids have any language if they weren't getting ABA? I don't know, right? So, um, so I think one of the things that could be really interesting is do we see differences, you know, in this real-time performance and in how kids are developing their lexicon based on the type of intervention that they're getting? Um, because we know other types of intervention are effective, um, most kids are getting ABA right now because that has the biggest evidence base behind it. Um, and I know they were trying to recruit to do um, Hannah More Than Words, which is more of a naturalistic teaching approach out in Boston, and parents didn't want to participate because they wanted ABA. Um, so it's, it's really, um, it's interesting. And so I don't know if we would see the same thing happening if they were getting you know, a different type of intervention or not, but I think that's something that definitely warrants further exploration, especially since we're trying to figure out what can we do to get the best, you know, how can we help these kids the most? And it may be that slower acquisition, but more robust acquisition may be better over the long, long time, you know, the longer period than just kind of getting these words in, and I, I'm not sure. For this task or in general? Um, that's a really hard question because um, they definitely have limited interest in some areas, but then we also see them be, um, some kids are real experts in other areas. So, um, you know, uh, there's kids who become experts on dinosaurs, experts on trains, and so they kind of have this incredible depth of knowledge in this one particular area. Um, I would, my guess is um, just like any of us, if it's not something that we're that interested in, um, we won't learn as much about it. And I think um, that could be part of it too. That's why I liked um, the categories that they chose for this task, is they're really early developing categories and they're something kids should have had experience with, right? So they, get, they see chairs every day. So even if they may not be that interested in chairs, this is kind of that ongoing thing that they're seeing. Um, the same with cars, we know that can be something that's of higher interest to kids with autism, and then the two, you know, birds are something that you're probably seeing on a very regular basis. Cats, we may see a difference there, um, but so so I'm not I'm not sure because I think it's it really depends on the kid. Thank you. 
So another way we could pull this out too is the animate versus the inanimate to see if there's a difference in how the kids are responding to those. Um, with this sample of kids, we're currently coding some other data and I can tell you, it's, so they're doing um, a looking paradigm and the kids with autism um, just do very different looking than the typical learners, a lot more kind of out of the corner of the eye. It just is very different qualitatively, which is interesting.